Hey everyone, welcome to 1992's edition of In the Abyss. I am Rob, and as we go into 1992, uh, I'm starting to realize on Monday, even though I said that the list in the 90s will start dwindling, I guess in the early 90s, it, it, it won't, it's not. When I started compiling this list for 1992, there's a lot of movies that came out in 92, and a lot of good movies, so... I guess for the at least the early 90s, we're still going to have a decent list of movies, and then it should start dwindling down, but we'll see. Um, I did leave out some films, Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, Chaplin, A River Runs Through It, Mighty Ducks, and, and once again, these are movies I own, but not necessarily making my top list, because ultimately each year I'm trying to find my favorite through the 50 years, and then showing you guys some movies that uh, I really enjoyed that maybe uh, you guys would enjoy as well. So I do have a good list for 1992. So let's let's start it off. And and once again, some of these you'll know, and 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 maybe some you don't know. Um, first one is Wayne's World. Most of us do know it. Um, Dana Carvey and Michael Myers do a great job, or Mike Myers. Michael Myers is from Halloween, but do a great job as as Wayne and Garth. Um, but to me, this movie is made by Rob Lowe. Uh, Rob Lowe, you know, found a new niche in the in the 90s. You know, in the 80s, he was the teenage heartthrob and uh, doing those kinds of movies. But we really start to discover that Rob Lowe has a, a great dry sense of humor and it really shines through starting in Wayne's World. And, and it, it kind of carries him forward to a lot of movies he does like Sex Tape and, and things like that. But then also what he does in his TV show like Parks and Rec and stuff like that. So, you know, Rob Lowe you know, kind of reinvented himself and, like I said, really starts to show here and he he, he really makes this film for me. Um, next up, uh, Christian Slater and Cuffs. Um, I'm not a huge Christian Slater fan and I know I mentioned mobsters and, and things that he was in, but uh, to me, this is his best movie. He is fantastic in this. His comedic timing, uh, the way he plays off of people, the way he does things, he is really, really good. And this is a a, a really good under the radar type comedy uh, that you've got to give it a shot. It's 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 pretty good. Another comedy, and uh, I'm actually repping the shirt for Ven Venice Beach, uh, two on two basketball, and that is White Man Can't Jump. Um, Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes at their finest. And once again, what do we just talk about in acting? It's how you play off each other. It's the banter. And they, the way they play off each other, the banter, um, it really carries this film and it's a lot of fun. And you root for them to win. You root for them to be friends. You root for them. And uh, it, it, it is another good, uh, fun comedy uh, in the early 90s. But once again, it comes down to the actors. And, and they do a great job together. Um, Tom Selleck in Mr. Baseball, you know, he's a pro baseball player who, uh, ends up having to go to Japan to, you know, re get his career going and kind of adapting to their traditions and their traits and, and the things that they do. It also stars Dennis Haysbert, you know, you see him in the, uh, you know, the insurance commercials and so on, but, uh, you know, he was in major league, you know, and then he's also Mr. Baseball, you know, um, and it, and it's a it's a good, fun, uh, different type of of baseball movie, and it's another one that I kind of think that falls under the radar that a lot of people probably haven't heard of. But it, it's an enjoyable film. Uh, it looks like most of it is shot in Japan, and and once again, as actors, that would be a blast. Um, but it's it's one you got to give it a shot. Um, this is a third. Of a, of a series. I haven't talked about the first two too much, um, but it's Lethal Weapon 3, and I, I really do enjoy 1 and 2. I actually think Lethal Weapon 2 is my favorite, and I didn't mention it in the year it came out, but um, I wanted to mention 3 because uh, it is another strong film. I like the storyline, but but the acting is really, really good. You have you know Danny Glover and, and Mel Gibson, of course, but then Joe Pesci and then you add Rene Russo to this in the last series, uh, the last of the series, and uh, you know the four of them are really, really strong together. And once again, this is a theme we're talking about. It's the continuity of the actors that really makes this work. And I haven't, like I said, talked about Lethal Weapon, so I thought it was a, a good time to uh, bring up uh, the series and uh, Lethal Weapon Three. 
Uh, next up is another Matt Dillon for me. A different type of role for him. It's a movie called Singles. Uh, it's about a group of people who live in a apartment building in Seattle and uh, how they interact and, and, and things like that. And you have a lot of, once again, good actors in it. Like I mentioned, Matt Dillon. You have uh, Bridget Fonda. You have Kira Sidwick. Um, and, and it's just their relationships and, and dealing with each other and Matt Dillon trying to create this band or start this band or get his band going um, in the grunge era of the 90s. And it, it's pretty cool because his drummer in the movie is Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam. So, you know, you have some real musicians in it and, and you have, um, you know, some really good actors in it. And it's another one that uh, probably the third one, I would say, that is kind of under the radar. Um, not my style of music, um, but a good soundtrack and, and a good movie. Okay, kind of switching gears here. Um, Michael Douglas, Sharon Stone, Basic Instinct, classic. Um, not necessarily as good for me as Fatal Attraction, but still a really, really good film. And it falls in line of those Michael Douglas type films that he was making in the late 80s and early 90s where, you know... Um, Mystery, suspense, sex, all those things to go together. And he really had a formula and he really did a good job with that formula. And this is another one of those in line. It's a good story. At the end, it's open-ended. You don't really know if they uh, catch the right person or not, um, which makes it fun. But uh, this is one that most of you guys know that I wanted to mention because, you know, I really like these era of Michael Douglas films. All right. Um... Not necessarily a great movie. It's a good movie. It has one of the greatest acting scenes of all time. We watch it a lot in class to talk about, you know, doing monologues and, and stuff like that. Alec Baldwin talking to the group, um, you know, um, ABC, AA, BB, C closing, always be closing, right? That's what it was. It was, you know, A always, B, B, C closing, always be closing, always be closing. You know, that that's the famous line in that scene. And he does just such a great job. But I wanted to mention it because you have Alan Arkin and you have Jack Lemmon and you have Al Pacino and you have Ed Harris. And like I said, Alec Baldwin, it, it's just such a great cast that at least you have to watch it once to, to sit there and experience it. Um, but, but it's not one of those ones you're going to, you know, revisit many, many times. Um, but it's worth, worth a watch. Um, Mariah Kelly, D.B. Sweeney, Cutting Edge, uh, great movie. He's a former hockey player. She's a figure skater. They get paired up, and the story goes on. I, I really like this movie. I enjoy it. I hate the ending, though, because you don't know if they win the gold medal or not. And my wife always says to me, it's not about that. It's that they found love. Well, they can find love and win the gold medal at the same time. So I don't love the way it ends, but it ends the way it does. And, and it's still a really, really good movie. It's really well acted. It's fun. Once again, their continuity, their relationship, their banter is what makes this work. And that is a theme in acting. It's not necessarily the movie. It's who's in the movie and how they make it work. Okay. Uh, one you guys all know, but I had to point out. The first in the Tarantino series, Reservoir Dogs, another great cast, you know, Harvey Keitel, uh, Tim Roth, you know, Michael Madsen, um, you know, Steve Buscemi. It's it's just, uh, it's, uh, you know, a really good cast. Not necessarily one of my favorite Tarantinos. I know a lot of people love this movie. I like it a lot. Um, I think some of the, the later ones are better, but uh, this is kind of what got his 10 going and uh, it, it holds that place in history, and, and it is a classic. Um, my son and, and his friends love it, and they actually uh, dress like them going to prom and posed in a few of the pictures to, to kind of have the famous walk picture. So, you know, it is definitely influential even for the, the younger ages, uh, you know, uh, juniors and seniors in high school. So it, it definitely stands the test of time. And, and like I said, a really strong film. Um, next up is Harrison Ford in Patriot Games. This is number two of the Jack Ryan series, the Tom Clancy novels. Um, Harrison Ford takes over for Alec Baldwin as Jack Ryan. Uh, James Earl Jones returns. Um, Ann Archer plays Jack Ryan's wife and other terrific actors we talk about quite a bit. Um, a great, you know, uh, thriller. Um, a lot of great scenes. Sean Bean, you know, who is like one of the ultimate villains 
um, is in this, you know, and uh, just does an amazing job. This is a really, really strong film, uh, and it's a great follow-up to The Hunt for Red October. You know, we talked about Goodfellas in 1990, and it really took Ray Liotta to the next level as an actor, and this was the next movie that he did, um, Unlawful Entry, Kurt Russell, Madeline Stowe. Um, they are a married couple who... Um, house is broken into Ray Liotta and his partner. They're the cops that come to answer the uh, 911 call and Ray Liotta becomes obsessed with Kurt Russell's wife and um, it gets going. It's sinister. It's crazy. It's Ray Liotta. And it's funny because we always talk about, you know, you watch Goodfellas and Ray Liotta's, hey, Karen, Karen. Well, they named Madeline Stone Karen in this. And so you get more Karen in this, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like they did this on purpose to kind of carry that Ray Liotta theme from Goodfellas to this. And this is a really good follow-up for him. And it's a really strong movie. And uh, it, it's really enjoyable to watch. And it's Ray Liotta at his peak. I mean, these are these are the movies now where we're seeing a ton of him after, uh, after the uh, Goodfellas success. So uh, if you haven't seen this, check it out. Um, just... A really good, fun movie. School Ties. Uh, Brendan Fraser uh, goes to a private school back in the period of times where, um, you know, Jews were looked down at in, in certain areas, in certain um, classes, if you will. And he goes there and kind of hides that identity um, to play football at this, this private prep school, if you will. Chris O'Donnell, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, you know, uh, Cole Hauser. You're seeing all of these guys start their careers now and, and many movies that they'll end up doing together. Um, but just, you know, really starting to see the beginning of what Matt Damon is going to become as an actor in this. He's really, really good. Brendan Fraser hits it out of the park in this. It's really, really a strong film. It's a great story. And, uh, you know... Um, there's a lot of different changes within this movie when it comes to how they deal with each other and the emotions and, and the, you know, the bigotry that was dealt with at that time, um, you know, that, that this movie really tells that story. And I think it's important, you know, especially in these times and stuff like that, that we don't forget history, that, that these certain bigotries existed and we've learned from them and we've grown from them. And, and School Ties really is one of those movies that makes that come alive and remind us that it went, in all, it went on in all facets of life. And people had to deal with these different things. And, and uh, like I said, it starts the career of some, of some wonderful young actors. Um, it, it's a really, really strong movie. If this is on TV, I'm watching it. I love it. Um, next up is another one I'll watch every time it's on TV. As a matter of fact, it was on the other day and I was watching it. Uh, a Few Good Men, you know, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson, Demi Moore, um, Kiefer Sutherland, Kevin Bacon. It goes on. There's just a really, really strong cast. It's really, really uh, Kevin Pollack as, as one of the other attorneys. Um, it's just really well acted once again. Uh, these guys do a really, really good uh, job. Um, and of course, there's some famous, famous lines, you know, you want me on that wall, you need me on that wall. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's just phenomenal. You want the truth, you can't handle the truth, you know, all of that stuff. I mean, it's just, that comes from the amazing work of the actors. And um, they all just do a phenomenal job. And of course, that banter between Tom Cruise and um, Jack Nicholson at the end there is off the charts. This is a really, really, really strong film. And, and you're starting to see a theme that I'm talking through with these films of the continuity and the energy and the banter between the actors. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And, and this is another one that's just outstanding. Um, Batman Returns, the second Batman with Michael Keaton. I'm bringing this one up once again because of the actors. Now you have Danny DeVito as the Penguin. You have Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. Uh, you bring in um, Christopher Walken as Max Shrek, and a lot of people don't know this, Max Shrek was the name of an actor who actually played the vampire in Nosferatu uh, back in the silent era films, and it's kind of there paying homage to him uh, by naming Christopher Walken Max Shrek in this film. But this is another one where it, it, it's a good movie, 
but I really believe it comes down to the cast. The cast is really, really strong, which makes the acting really, really strong, which makes the story strong. And and to me, this is the last of this series of Batmans that, that are really, really good. The next one with Val Kilmer is fine. The last one, eh. But, but these first two are um, really, really strong because... You know, you go from Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson to Michael Keaton, Michelle Pfeiffer, Danny DeVito, and Chris Walken. And so you have this powerful, you know, once again, theme uh, cast and the way they work together and the way that they do things together is 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 really powerful. Which kind of segues into probably um, the heavy of heavyweights of the acting world during 1992. And that's uh, Clint Eastwood, Gene Hackman, and Morgan Freeman in The Unforgiven. Um, I remember seeing this in the theater, and just from the acting standpoint, it's off the charts. It's long, it's drawn out, it probably could have been shorter, but um, you know, when you're dealing with three heavyweight actors like uh, the three I named, uh, it's worth the watch. I have a great interview with Morgan Freeman where he actually talks about working with um, Gene Hackman in that scene where... Um, He's whipping Morgan Freeman and he kind of whispers in his ear that um, I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I'm going to match up the answers to the answers you already gave me. And if something's off, I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to hurt you real bad. And Morgan Freeman said he felt what Gene Hackman was saying. He said it was visceral. He said he didn't have to act at all. He just had a deal. And, and that's the ultimate compliment you can pay to an actor is that they can make you feel what is going on and we always talk about acting is not the result of what you're doing acting is the result of how you affect others and when you can affect others like that you know you're doing a great job so i mean this is one that has to be mentioned just from the standpoint of of the the acting it's it's ridiculously good all right down to my final two for 1992 um runner up it's a terrific baseball movie uh a league of their own Gina Davis, Lori Petty, Madonna do a phenomenal job. Not a big Rosie O'Donnell fan. She's terrific in this. Um, and then Tom Hanks, of course, as Jimmy Dugan is ridiculously good. Um, of course, the famous, there's no crying. There's no crying in baseball, you know. And as you notice through this video, and I'm not intending to do this, there's just so many quotes to quote from all of these movies um, I think this is the most quotes I've ever done during one of these video segments. I, I mean, it's just, you know, the, the way the girls and, 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 and Tom Hanks interact with each other, it just makes this such a, a powerful film. And to be able to tell the story of women's professional baseball during that period of time uh, of World War II and even past that period to keep it alive for the years they did, I think it was nine years or something like that, is good to keep. Once again, I like keeping history alive. I like to tell the stories, good and bad. It's part of what makes us us. And also appreciating a period of time that we did not live in, that we didn't understand, that we don't know. And, and to be able to make those come alive is, is why we're actors, in my opinion. And uh, this is another one of those movies that really does it. And, and, and once again, the story is really, really strong, but the acting is what carries it and the continuity between the girls and, and their coach, um, Jimmy Dugan. Uh, really makes this a really, really strong film. And this probably would be number one if it wasn't for probably um, Marissa Tomei's greatest movie, and that is My Cousin Vinny. And of course, you know, uh, Joe Pesci hits it out of the park. You know, the two Utes. Uh, I mean, you know, the courtroom scenes are great. Um, you know, you just, there's just so much good acting in this once again. You know, uh, Fred Gwynn as, as the judge, you know, that a lot of people only knew as Herman Munster and didn't realize, you know, that he had done other movies like Secret of My Success and My Cousin Vinny. Um, you know, um, it, it's, it's, it's a really good movie. And most of us know this movie. We know the lines. We know the film. And um, it, was, it, was a, it was a tough pick between this and League of Their Own. But, I mean, ultimately... Uh, my cousin Vinny is going to win out. Marissa Tomei, and her, once again, her banter with Joe Pesci is really, really strong and and really, really good. And the way that they play off each other is is absolutely you know phenomenal. Um, Ralph Macchio, I, you know, we only know him from Karate Kid. He does a good job as the the nephew or the cousin, excuse me, um, who is falsely accused and. You know, it's it's just, like I said, it's a really, really good film. We all know it. It's fun. And it's one that we always will revisit because it is a classic with a lot of classic lines. 
Um, music, I'll be brief. Um, just wanted to mention a few bands I haven't mentioned before. Uh, first and foremost, Dream Theater. Um, they're, they're a fun band who experiments in, in different changes to their music, uh, have longer songs, um, and um, they, they are not afraid to take chances. Lyrically, they are really in-depth. Um, tell a lot of different stories. There's some, you know, the, the writing's great. They're just a really good band. And to me, this album is their second album, but it's the one that really got them going. It has the big hit on it, Pull Me Under, and it has Metropolis Part One. Another Day is on here. It's a, it's a, it's a good, good, good album. Uh, I think there's some ones coming up for them that are better, but um, this is the one that got them going. Um, the next one to talk about is Blind Guardian, uh, somewhere uh, far beyond. Um, the reason I want to mention them is, you know, they like the demons and, and wizardry of of uh, stories. You know, they're big fans of Tolkien. So you get Lord of the Ring type stories. You get stuff like that in, in, in previous albums. And and they, they like telling those stories. And it's it's that where the worlds connect between film and music. It's almost like uh, you get the, the stories of some of these... Um, books and movies in music and lyrics um, and Blind Guardian is as good as anybody when it comes to um, doing that and for me the earlier stuff is pretty good but this is the first album for me that takes um, my liking for them to the next level and then the albums past this are, are really really strong as well but uh, I wanted to point this one out for you guys um, but number one in um 1992 is Black Sabbath's De Dehumanizer. Uh, you see the return of Ronnie James Dio for his third uh, album with Black Sabbath. It's probably their heaviest album. Um, they did a song for Terminator 2 um, on this. Um, I'm sorry. It is from Wayne's World during the Terminator scene in Wayne's World, um, Time Machine, um, which is really, really strong. Um but uh, you know, has songs like "I," "Computer," "Computer God," uh, "After All," "The Dead." I think it's "After All the Dead." Yeah, um, it's uh, there's a lot of good good stuff. Um, like I said, it's it's pretty strong and it's pretty heavy, and um, it's it's the return of Black Sabbath with their you know their Mach Two, if you will, lineup. Um, I also wanted to point out that. You know, this goes back to the stories we talk about, how you have to adjust to the people you're dealing with. You don't try to make them adjust to your style. And so, you know, Black Sabbath now is bringing their style back to how they played with Ronnie James Dio in the early 80s, but also um, going with a heavier early 90s sound, not kind of just trying to recreate the 80s. So they continue to evolve, they continue to change, and they continue to adapt, which gives us new music to everything they do every year. And um, that that is why this album, to me, is really, really strong. Um, I, I like all the songs on it. I enjoy it. Um, and like I said, whenever you can connect the film and music world, it, it kind of just puts all these videos together at the end. So anyways... Um, I know it's not most people's music naming Dream Theater, Blind Guardian, and Black Sabbath, but I, I'm going to talk about my favorites because they're my videos, and that's what I'm going to do. So number one in 1992 was Black Sabbath's Dehumanizer, and then, of course, like I said, 1992, My Cousin Vinny for the top film. I appreciate you guys watching these. Um, you know, we'll keep going. We'll keep giving the list. Hopefully you guys are watching these movies and trying to catch up. Um, once again, leave your comments in the comment section. We'll see you tomorrow.